Good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been tasked with starting off the conference today talking about uh, just how big the problem really is with pediatric uveitis. Um, as Dr. Foster was alluding to, uh, the children with uveitis end up with the disease most of the time of their entire life, and uh, that's a lot of years. So, Epidemiology, a word or two about that, um, really is trying to quantify uh, the numbers, uh, the disease itself, how many kids have it in the country or the world, uh, which different types they have, how they present. Uh, the incidence is uh, defined by the number of new cases in a population per time period, usually over the course of a year. And prevalence is um, typically the number of total cases at any given time. So you'll see those uh, throughout the presentation. So a lot of uh, troubles that people have with studies done in epidemiology and uh, childhood uveitis especially, or just uveitis in general, uh, oftentimes it's because before 2005, there wasn't a standard way to describe uveitis between uh, different practices reliably. And so comparing the different studies, the findings of the, of the different examiners wasn't something that could have been uh, reliably done. The standardization of uveitis nomenclature working group uh, in 2005 published a paper uh, outlining just these, uh, the uh, data showing uh, just between or standardizing the actual way of reporting data for the purposes of, uh, of clinical studies. And so that was uh, a great help to the future of these epidemiological studies. One of the things that they did was actually help to define the anatomical locations and different types of uveitis that you can see here. And you might hear these words in the clinic when you come into your intermediate posterior and pan uveitis being different types of uveitis based on where in the eye the inflammation actually is occurring. Other uh, classifications have to do with the time course of the disease, whether or not it's a short-lived disease or whether or not it's stubborn and uh, persists beyond the times it's been treated. Uh, acute, recurrent, and chronic listed here. Other concerns uh, with some of the studies listing in, in, in the literature trying to see just how prevalent uveitis is in uh, the world is uh, that most of these studies have been done at tertiary centers, meaning academic centers like Mercy, um, where patients are actually sent here. They've been through other doctors who've had a difficult time uh, treating them. And uh, the tough cases, the ones that got through the system, uh, have been sent to us, and whether or not this accurately represents the real population of uveitis out there that's seen by the general ophthalmology uh, community. A study at UCLA done in 1996 actually showed that there was a big discrepancy between these populations, a lot more anterior uveitis seen in the population uh, in the community-based doctors rather than the university referral practices. And of course, across the world, a large variation depending on where in the world the studies have been done. This is just a sampling of different uveitis epidemiology studies that have been done uh, and a, a very large variation in the uh, numbers from those studies. The largest study that's been done in the US to date was done um, about 15 years ago, reported in the 2004. Uh, at the community in Northern California of Kaiser Permanente, a large cluster of, of patients of uh, basically all ages, uh, look through the entire database, not just uh, children, but specifically in children uh, aged 0 to 14, 131,000 children were seen to have, uh, were, were data from them were collected. And it was found that about nine of them had uveitis. So the incidence and the prevalence was reported to be about seven in 100,000. The overall incidence, including adults, was actually much larger, and this is very typical of the representative numbers that you would see in most studies as uveitis is more prevalent in adults than children overall. By location, most of these children had anterior uveitis, and of course, a couple others are represented. Uh, one could question whether or not these numbers are actually conservative, and that's because if you look at the study, they didn't include people who had active uveitis during the course of the year that they studied these patients. If you didn't have a flare, or you didn't have active disease during that time, you weren't actually categorized as, categorized as having uveitis. And so the prevalence, uh, would, it, would, it would speak to the fact that probably the prevalence is actually lower 
uh, in the report than what is actually existing in the population. So is uveitis a rising problem? Um, of course, in many diseases, the uh, changes in the disease state over time has been documented, different types of diseases other than uveitis. But in these two studies, another epidemiological study done in Minnesota in the 60s, uh, compared with the one mentioned earlier in California over 40 years, shows that the incidence of uveitis in general, not just in children, has grown uh, almost threefold, according to these studies. Uh, and this might be because that people are living longer and the majority of uveitis is seen in older people, um, the lowest prevalence seen in children. And so it, one could speculate that perhaps childhood uveitis isn't really contributing to the rise in uveitis in general. However, if you were to consider that the number of children getting uveitis every year is the same and the population of children is growing, that the prevalence might actually be growing as well. These are different patterns from studies done across the world, as you can see several continents represented here, um, showing mainly that the incidence of uveitis in the childhood population or the, in, the, in the pediatric population is fairly consistent, more or less five to seven per 100,000 get it every year. However, the prevalence is all over the map. The previous study had actually listed seven. We have 27 here and 450 over in India. Um, that number can vary quite a lot depending on the type of study done, how many years were included, and uh, how much data was included. So that's something to consider when you're looking at these studies as well. Uveitis specifically in uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, a study in Germany done in 2007 showed that about 12% of all kids with JIA uh, presented with uveitis, and that was over uh, 3,000 kids studied, with about 70 to 80% of each of, of, of these kids with uveitis being in the oligoarthritis uh, category, uh, being female and ANA positive. So how big really is the problem of uh, uveitis in children? If we were to do a little extrapolation based on some of the numbers that we've seen in these studies and so far, uh, about 300,000 children in the United States are seen to have uh, JIA. 10% of these, more or less, uh, have uveitis, so that would equal about 30,000 kids. And if one were to consider that JIA accounts for about 20 to 40 percent, maybe average 30 percent of all kids with uveitis in the United States, then you would think that about 100,000 kids in the United States have uveitis overall. Now, the literature also shows that about 70 percent of these children have either chronic or recurrent uveitis, which would mean that about 70,000 of these children are in that category, which need uh, more than just one visit a year or even every two years. <clears throat> Many of them need multiple visits, maybe even more than six visits a year, but given an average of six visits a year or one every two months, that would equal about 420,000, almost half a million patient visits per year, just of pediatric uveitis in, a, in, a, in, a, in the medical practice here. Uh, if there are about 100,000, or 100, sorry, 100 uveitis specialists uh, in the country, as those are listed on the uveitis.org website, that would mean that each one of these specialists would have to see uh, 4,200 visits just in the chronic or recurrent pediatric uveitis population alone during the year. And if, if I were to be aggressive in saying that each specialist sees about 200 patients per year, or 200 patients per week over the course of 50 weeks, 10,000 total patient visits, that would mean that the amount of chronic uveitis uh, patients uh, in the pediatric population seen take off almost half of their clinic visits throughout the year. And with most uveitis specialists seeing only about 10 to 15 percent of their uh, practice in the pediatric population, you can imagine that there's a large amount of, of children that uh, are not being serviced by uveitis specialists and a grossly insufficient number of uveitis specialists in the United States. There's a lot more that are needed. Uh, and this is mainly because the ophthalmology residency programs, many of them do not have a full-time uveitis specialist and many ophthalmologists in the community aren't comfortable dealing with the types of therapy that's needed to treat chronic uveitis. Uh, a study done here uh, in Boston in 2005 over the course of 20 years showed that most kids, uh, the average time to see a uveitis specialist is about two years. And this correlated directly with uh, the amount of vision loss and complications that were present when uh, the children first were seen. This chart actually shows that with the left axis showing worsening vision on the, uh, as you go up, 
and the time growing is a direct correlation between the amount of time and the worsening of the vision and complications. A study done across the nation showed that uh, many of these children at baseline had some pretty bad qualities to the disease, either in both eyes or uh, chronic or recurrent disease, many of them taking uh, over two years to be presenting to the uveitis specialist, and 10% of them were legally blind by the time they first saw a uveitis specialist with at least one or two complications uh, overall. Uh, a third of these patients ended up needing systemic immunomodulatory therapy, and one in five of them uh, ended up needing a surgical procedure. The implications of this being that delayed diagnosis in childhood uveitis can lead to uh, several complications, worsening of vision, sometimes permanent, the need for uh, immunomodulatory therapy. Uh, delayed diagnosis also leads to, uh, or very oftentimes lead to, uh, extended exposure to corticosteroid therapy, which as Dr. Foster said, does lead to trouble almost every single time. And the disease process over the course of their lifetime is uh, quite taxing on the patient uh, and the medical community in general, trying to treat them as the limited options for children in treating uh, can be quite uh, frustrating at times. Another uh, important thing to remember, especially dealing with children, is that the problem of amblyopia, a, a certain window in the first 10 years of life or so where the child needs to establish visual connections between the brain and the eye is there. So fighting against that clock, uh, fighting the irreversible vision loss that they may have is important. So in the end, uh, it's very important uh, given all these problems that if someone is not comfortable dealing with the type of uveitis or if the parent's not comfortable with the situation, it's time to move along to somebody who knows how to deal with it. Uh, as the earlier they get to the uveitis specialist, the lesser the chance they have of developing complications in amblyopia. <laughs>